Second hour of our program on the line with us is our old buddy Phil Itner, the veteran war correspondent now based in Kiev, Ukraine. Uh, he has a video blog that he updates on a regular basis over on YouTube that you can easily find by just going to youtube.com and plugging in his name, uh, which is Philip Itner, P-H-I-L-I-P-I-T-T-N-E-R. Uh, Itner Philip, the reverse of that is his Twitter handle. Phil, welcome back to the program. So uh, uh, I, I'm seeing headlines that there has been a, a breakthrough. I, I've, I've also seen articles saying, no, it's not quite a breakthrough, but it is a victory or whatever, uh, through some of the Russian lines in, in some uh, to Tokmak. Uh, I have no idea where this is or what this means. Can you, can you fill us in? Tokmak is a uh, transportation hub that is south of Bakhmut on the road towards um, uh, uh, Melitopol, which is a a town on the Sea of Azov. So it's about halfway between that contested, uh, the, the, you know, that, that city of Bakhmut where there's been such intense fighting, and then all the way down to the uh, Sea of Azov, which is where what would break off the land bridge between Russia and Crimea. So, you know, tactically and strategically important for the Ukrainians. So it's about halfway between those two. And again, it's important because it's a transport hub. Mm -hmm. um, so if they can take control of Takbuk, uh, it, it would be a, a big, uh, it would be a big development. It would be, it would be uh, significant. Uh, we'll have to wait and see whether they can secure it. Uh, but we also know that there's advances in other parts of the front lines. Uh, the question just continues to remain. Uh, can they get behind those rows and rows and rows of defensive minefields and anti-tank weapons and trench lines. And then once they've broken through that to then, you know, uh, kind of exploit that, that, and uh, maybe try and, right. you know, really pressure the Russians to, to withdraw their troops. But ultimately, again, as we've talked so many different times, um, it's all about getting to the sea and Tukmuk is about halfway there. And, and getting behind the lines like that, that seems like something where an F-16 or a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a sophisticated missile battery would be a big help. Sure. Uh, uh, just fly right uh, over the lines. An F-16, that's right. An F-16 would be very good at that. Uh, hitting the supply lines that, that support those defensive lines with long-range missiles like the Attackums, which apparently were going to get a couple over here, but certainly not in the numbers that maybe the Ukrainians were hoping, and it's still kind of contentious, but it does sound like they're going to at least get a few of these long-range attack of missiles uh, that they can fire from the HIMARS. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, if, if the Ukrainians had uh, the, the weapons that they have been requesting for quite some time, and which many advocates in the West are saying, this is something we need to, you know, either... Either do it or don't do it, but this drip, drip, drip isn't helping anybody. And mm -hmm. uh, you know, we had a we had a visit here today, an unexpected, uh, unannounced visit by the head of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg. He arrived here, and one of the uh, of the many things that were said here, because he came with both the British and the French defense ministers, completely <laughs> unannounced, wow. and met with Zelensky. Um, Stoltenberg, after his meeting with Zelensky, said, "Look, the 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 stronger we make the Ukrainians." the quicker this is going to end and the, and the sooner they will defeat the Russians. We need to basically intimating, we, we, we need to decide whether or not we're going to support Ukraine in its effort for victory. Not this kind of ambiguous, we'll do whatever it takes for them, we'll support them for however long, however long it takes. There's a shift that I can kind of see happening, and none of it is def definitive yet, but this kind of, this this attitude uh, is, is shifting to a like, you know, if, if if we have to stop an ambiguous support for Ukraine and actually definitively say we want to see the Ukrainians win this war, right? And that's kind of what Stoltenberg brought to Kiev today. Yeah, I think all the all the fear and hysteria around. Well, if the Ukrainians have too much of an advance against the Russians, Putin might use nukes, and that'll be the end of the world. Uh, I, I, I right. think most of that has has just gone by the wayside. Well, and it does seem to be uh, a, an empty threat from yeah. the Russians. I mean, who wants to test that fully? But the Russians know, I am sure, that the second that they use any kind of nuclear weapon, 
that their days are numbered. It's yeah. over. Uh, yeah. If they nuke Kiev, uh, even if they don't nuke a, a Western, uh, you know, or a NATO member state, it, to, the use of nuclear weapons, which China has vocally told Moscow they don't want to have happen because mm. it sets a bad precedent. But the second Moscow uses a nuke, it's over. It's done. The, the 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 international community will turn against Russia. Um, NATO, I suspect, would become directly involved. There would be a no-fly zone. These kind of things would be devastating for Russia, and it would it would start a clock ticking. It, it is my humble belief uh, towards a, a real uh, serious uh, crisis in the Kremlin. So, this empty threat of them, I consider, and in many, there's a growing support for this mentality of it's an empty threat because they know right. that if they use it, that's it, they're done. Yeah. Now, uh, we're sending and other, uh, others are sending uh, fighter aircraft to Ukraine. Apparently, they don't have them yet. But uh, I understand that the Ukrainian pilots are already training on these things. Are, is, are these web-based trainers or are, are they, have they gotten receipt of actual um, uh, simulators, flight simulators. Well, they have the, they have simulators uh, in in the UK in particular. They have mm -hmm. a, a a good number of those simulators, and so certainly there are Ukrainian pilots in Britain that are training on simulators. But there's also you know there are other locations around Europe uh, where they might be physically getting into some of these F-16s mm -hmm. um, because they are in. I mean, we're not going to necessarily hear about it, but that capacity is there, and they are definitely training Ukrainian troops, uh, pilots to get their hands on the F-16s. So um, we don't know exactly when the F-16s are going to make their their uh, arrival, uh, but we do know. That the Abrams are here, and that has been that has been uh, verified. Uh, there are there are U.S. main battle tanks uh, here now. How soon they get to the front? Uh, it's probably more a matter of days than weeks. Certainly not months. They're physically here, so uh, we'll see what the Abrams can do out on the front lines. They've got about another month, give or take. Uh, with the weather the way it is. Mm -hmm. um, so that's plenty of time to get those Abrams out there. And, and that will be, that'll be something to monitor and watch very closely. I'm curious about the politics of all of this on the ground. Um, last night in the Republican debate, uh, uh, Ramaswamy was the one guy who was uh, echoing Putin, you know, who was uh, pushing Putin talking points. There is a, a small contingent within the Republican Party that is all in with Putin. And of course, Donald Trump is all in with Putin on this. And, uh, you know, and he made the point that uh, this is a government in Ukraine that has banned 11, uh, or whatever the number was he gave, uh, opposition parties. And uh, of course, when a country is at war, uh, they tend to try to, at, at the very least, minimize internal political dissension. But I'm curious what the political situation is in Ukraine right now. How popular well, it's, is it's, is uh, It's not just that, Zelensky. though, Tom. It's not just that. It, it, the guys who make that point about the, um, the 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 opposition parties that have been shut down, uh, journalists that may have uh, journalist organizations or outlets that may have been shut down, even uh, to a certain degree, the Orthodox Church, they they reveal an ignorance about the situation on the ground here in Ukraine. In that there have been uh, the analogy I use is that they have been in a shotgun wedding for centuries, and it's been abusive, and it's been uh, uh, toxic, but it has been a marriage. And so what is happening is that the Ukrainians are clamping down on, on basically sock puppet um, uh, organizations, organizations uh... pretending to be Ukrainian, but they're really Russian. They're funded by Moscow. They, have, they hold, they hold pro-Moscow, pro-Russian uh, 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 positions. They are infiltrators. They're fifth columnists. These are not political parties. They're not. They're not. Um, they're they're not earnest journalists. They're not. You know, it's one. The, the freedom of speech and freedom of the press is allowed here, but you can't involve yourself in information warfare. And that's what a lot of those outlets were doing, as were many of the political parties who were paid for by the Kremlin. It's not that they are they are clamping down on dissent. They have a real problem with infiltration by Russian by Russian sympathizers and no country at war is going to allow a fifth column to openly operate uh, within their country, whether that's the church, uh, a political party or a newspaper. 
the the Ukrainians make a very big point of if you are if you are legitimate in your opposition to uh, the government or to whatever it is, uh, if, if you are a Ukrainian who holds uh, a dissenting uh, opinions, that's one thing. Right. But if you're paid for and bought by the Kremlin, then you're not working in good faith. You're you not are legitimate. A, you are a fifth yeah. columnist. Yeah, I that's get right. It. That's what so, all that is. So Ramaswamy and, and was just... To hear that coming from... Go ahead. That, to, hear that, to hear that coming from Ramaswamy shows that uh, he doesn't understand what's happening here. Right, or he does understand and he's willing to parrot the Putin Or he's willing to, that's right. Yeah, which is is equally equally disgusting. Um, uh, We have about a minute and a half left here until we hit a hard break, Phil. Uh, But to to my question, is Zelensky still wildly popular in Ukraine? Yes, he is, but he's not, he is not, uh, he's not a monolith. Mm-hmm. Um, he is widely supported because he is seen to be a, a wartime leader who is accepted on the global stage and can and can bring support from a, the international community. But make no mistake about it, all Ukrainians are invested in this war. Yeah. And, and if Zelensky were to disappear tomorrow, somebody else would take his place because this is an existential threat. And the, and it's not the the belief in the support of an independent and sovereign Ukraine does not lie solely with Zelensky. Yes, he has support, but it's not it's not all consolidated around him. He's not the center of gravity. The Ukrainian people are the center of gravity. Yeah. And and what's the name of his party? Uh, he uh, he is uh, United uh, United Ukraine. I United Ukraine party. Okay. So and and uh, interesting. I you know I find the whole thing fascinating and and hey I, there, I am hopeful to... that you can stay safe there, Phil, and and uh, that uh, Ukraine can prevail in this. I uh, you know, uh, Phil. Thanks a lot for dropping by today. It's always great talking with you. All right. Talk to you soon. Yep. Bye. Thank you. You can find Phil's video blog over on uh, YouTube. Just plug in his name, Philip Itner, P-H-I-L-I-P-I-T-T-N-E-R, over on YouTube, and you will find it and share it with your friends.